you don't benefit from being isolated from an adversary who threatens you. Why would you not want more information about what they're thinking, about what they're doing, probe them, challenge them? You're never going to get down any of those roads if you just stand there uh, from a distance and and caricature your adversary in ways that embarrass them in public and that don't contribute any new information to your system. When you hear the word Iraq, you'll likely think of the 2003 war in and against Iraq conducted by the US and its allies. Now, you'll probably think of Saddam Hussein too. Of course, he was in charge of that country for decades beforehand. And it turns out he had a very close and intimate relationship, again, with the US and its allies. And it turns out the nature of that relationship offers some pretty key insights into what can go wrong with Western foreign policy and how you can pay the price for supporting somebody who's actually quite unsavory. With me to discuss that today and the lessons we can learn from that in the 2020s is the author of this book, The Achilles Trap, Saddam Hussein, the United States and the Middle East, 1979 to 2003. And that is by Steve Cole, a fantastic author. Steve, welcome to Downstream. Thank you for having me. You were the Washington Post correspondent for South Asia uh, during the early 1990s, which is an amazing beat. Kashmir, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Did you know then that Afghanistan was going to be this central story over the next 25 years? No, I didn't. But um, I did become aware of some of the groups and forces that would eventually uh, yield its importance in the on 9-11 because my job was to cover the CIA's covert action program in Pakistan and Afghanistan where they were arming and funding some of the Mujahideen rebels opposed to the, well, by the time I got there, the post-Soviet government in Kabul. And there was a big debate on the ground among Afghans in exile about the extent to which CIA money and particularly the the uh, frontline officers of the Pakistani intelligence service, ISI, were favoring um, radical Islamist factions of the resistance at the expense of royalists or other moderates, um, relatively speaking. And, and that was something that I wrote about. And then for those of us who were just, you know, correspondents who, were, who would go over the uh, mountains from Pakistan into Afghanistan to cover the war from the guerrillas' side, the generally you could count on Afghan hospitality, even with the Islamist factions. And so, if somebody said, "Yeah, you can travel with us, and we'll watch out for you," you could get a reasonable um, bargain there. No one was going to kidnap you. But um, the biggest threat at that time were these loose groups of Arabs who were volunteering from various parts of uh, the Maghreb and Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, and they started pulling people out of cars and just executing them on the side of the road. That was the only kind of instance of that sort of threat to working journalists. So everyone became instantly aware of it, aid workers too. And uh, and then trying to get a handle on who these people were, how they were being funded, how they were organized was part of the story in those days. So that was um, a, a subject that I continued to report on through the 90s, even after I left uh, the South Asia beat. Who's the most zealous out of all those groups? You said the Maghreb, Saudi. Was there any particular sort of nationality that stood out for? I'm not sure that it wasn't based on nationality, though they were, they were certainly clustered that way. The Egyptians had a, rec had a reputation for being particularly focused on apostasy and internal purges, ideological purity. I have this vague memory of everyone being afraid of the Algerians, and I don't know why, but that was maybe because there were some particular cases where they were identified as, as people who had just stopped vehicles, pulled people out, given them 30 seconds and shot them in the head. So it could have been anybody, but that's who and they had, had the reputation. Did they have any demands or was it just- No, it's just, you, you shouldn't be here. You're infidels. This is our war. You know, you have no, there's no role for you here, even as witnesses or as providers of, you know, humanitarian aid. Wow. So, and that's when you were in the country? I was, was yeah, I was covering the war from both sides. I mean, the danger was if you were traveling with the guerrillas because then you were traveling through uh, places that were sometimes contested among the factions in the guerrilla side. 
there was also you know, then you could go fly to Kabul and pick up with uh, then President Najibullah's uh, forces and and fly with their military to the you know kind of island hopping lily pad hopping they controlled kind of what NATO controlled in the end the cities but nothing in between them and the only way you could get from one place to another was to fly over most of Afghanistan to another city and you know that wasn't risk free but again I didn't really wasn't afraid of my host you just you could be in the wrong place at the wrong time but I mean, the main thing I don't know how other people feel but I always felt as a correspondent and I've traded notes with others now that we've made it to the most of the most of the way to the other side of our careers it's like I didn't I, I came to terms with my mortality pretty quickly <laughs> you know, if I was going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time so be it but um, I really didn't want to be kidnapped that was the thing that just seemed like it would be very very unpleasant and so I think we were all very attentive to that risk more than the risk of you know being someplace where a mortar shell landed well, what was the role of the CIA in the rise of the of the Taliban? Obviously, they really become a, a major national political force in the early 1990s. Yeah. Um, far before they be, sort of go to the forefront of, of, of the global uh, political conversation. But yeah, what was the role of the CIA with all that? Well, it was, it was the legacy of the role they played during the 80s, uh, during the anti-Soviet war. Because, of course, the Taliban really came to um, prominence in October 1994. At that point, the Americans had abandoned Afghanistan, but they had left behind a guerrilla movement that was dominated by Islamists, some of whom became the Taliban. And the um, principal reason that happened was that the CIA decided to outsource the political side of the war to the Pakistanis. Uh, Pakistanis sort of required that or said they required it, but the Americans didn't push back. And there was a this is a post-Vietnam kind of syndrome. The the kind of lessons learned from the failures in Vietnam was we're terrible at picking winners and losers uh, in the developing world. So if there's a local partner who says they've got it and they know who's the best uh, sort of organized, the most effective in the field and so on, let's just defer to them. We don't have an interest in that. And it was um, as I as we were talking about. It was only at the end of the war, after they'd had success in expelling the Soviet Union from Afghanistan, and Afghan groupings started to compete internally for power, anticipating that they would come to power. That the it was clear that the United States did now have an interest in that outcome because you could see that. Uh, groups such as the Hizbi Islami group led by Gulbuddin Hekmati, a notorious name at that time, um, were favored by the Pakistanis and they were using American and Saudi resources to consolidate control over the rebellion. And it was clear when they came to power that they were not going to be um, moderate in their outlook towards um, Afghan culture, but also they were going to be hostile to the um, interests of at least the Americans, if not the Saudis as well. So you mentioned the ISI, the Pakistani mm -hmm. um, Security Services. Can you speak about them a bit? Because, again, the shorthand for people who are skeptical of Western foreign policy would be mm -hmm. to blame the CIA. But the ISI, play, they play this massive role yeah. with the formation of the Taliban, don't they? Yeah, they do. Um, absolutely. And so the ISI is the principal intelligence service of the military in Pakistan. And, of course, the military has either ruled directly or indirectly pretty much since Pakistani independence. And so they're a very powerful organization. They're well-resourced. Um, you know, their agenda is the agenda of the Pakistani military, which is Pakistan's security. Um, they, uh, during the 1970s, under General Zia al Haq, who was the military dictator of that era, the ISI was encouraged to take a more explicitly religious approach to uh, backing guerrillas, um, not only in Afghanistan, but later in Kashmir as well. And so when they had a choice between backing, say, a nationalist movement that was secular or not overtly religious in its ideology versus one that might belong to, say, the international network of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, as Hizb did, they would choose the, the religious groups. And it mattered because they were the ones doling out the weapons, the cash, and the training, and as the Americans started to pour in, you know what became thought of as war-winning weapons like the Stinger missiles and uh, 
and other weapons that could cause one faction to gain a power over others, ISI directed those weapons toward the Islamists. Now they they thought they were riding a tiger. Um, you know, I don't know how many three-star Pakistani generals you've met, but I've not met many that are religious, profoundly religious. <laughs> there are some, uh, but many of them are, you know, familiar secular Punjabi types. Um, but they had a cynical attitude about the religious groups that they were backing. They thought that they could control them. They thought that they were more motivated um, and easier to manage in some respects than the than the more nationalist ones. And they thought that through them, they could control Afghanistan and also that it, their religiosity would help them in their principal goal, which was to deny influence to India, because these Islamist groups were particularly hostile to, to India's um, you know, secular and Hindu-influenced government. So that was the reason that they built this machine. Um, they thought incorrectly, as it turned out, that they could control it. And the Taliban arose out of that whole enterprise that was funded to the tune of billions of dollars during the 1980s. And uh, once they emerged uh, in 1994, I mean, just very briefly, I think in among the journalists who covered it and and historians and others who've gone back and looked at it in some detail, there's you know there's a reasonable debate about how spontaneous the first Taliban emergence in Kandahar was in October 1994. But whether you credit the idea that there was a kind of an indigenous revolt that they started, or you think the whole thing was an ISI manipulation, there is no doubt that four to five months after they emerged they were a client of ISI and they were being funded and, and resourced uh, under the same hypothesis that had guided the ISI during the 1980s. And are the ISI still a big player in oh, yeah. Central Asia? Absolutely. Well, and certainly in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Well, they want to be in Afghanistan um, and they're important in the, the potential of anti-Indian movements in Kashmir and uh, even potentially in the Punjab, although pretty marginal these days. And where are the Iranians in all of this? Because of course you have Dari speakers in particularly in the in the west of Afghanistan. Iran has a perceived national interest too in terms of having a clientelistic kind of political relationship with certain groups in Afghanistan. So where are they? Well, it's I mean it's a you know, it's an interesting subject. The Iranians of course for the reasons you described, they've always seen themselves as having an interest in Afghanistan, which is a neighbor um, and, and also a has been at times a source of instability that washes into Iran, just as that instability has washed into Pakistan in the form of millions of refugees, but also narcotics and guns and other things that they would like to control better than they do sometimes. But they have um, ties through language, culture, and and uh, religion to parts of the Afghan population, some large parts. Of course, you know, of course, Iran is a majority Shia country and Afghanistan is majority Sunni, but there are significant Shia populations, often marginalized in the central of the country, in the uh, the Hazaras are primarily Shia. And that was where Iran kind of tried to build its footprint uh, for during the 1980s. They were sort of partial participants in the anti-Soviet conflict, their own revolution still consolidating impeded how much they could kind of organize themselves to participate, but they were certainly influential. And that remained true right through the 1990s. The, they also became adversaries of the Taliban, however, primarily because the Taliban were and are ardent uh, Diobandi Sunni ideologists who have no time for the Shia um, claim to Islamic legitimacy, and they, during the 1990s, waged a you know, near genocidal campaign against the Shia in central Afghanistan. And now you know, they rhetorically say they've learned that, you know, that there's room for, for all of these cultures in uh, Afghanistan and that they won't systematically discriminate against uh, the Shia this time around. But you know, if you talk to Hazaras, they, they feel that on the ground, that's not really playing out and nobody. So anyway, Iran and the Taliban almost went to war in 2000. For a few months, they were mobilizing for an interstate conflict uh, because uh, 
the Taliban had killed some Iranian diplomats in Mazar that outraged the, the Iranian government. But, um, you know, these days my sense is that the Iranians are trying to, like Pakistan, just find some way to prevent Afghanistan from causing them trouble at home. And so that means trying to build relations with the Taliban if they can. And was that a variable in terms of the US position in all this? They're worried about encroaching Iranian influence and that's why after 94, the sort of coming out party of the of the Taliban as this major political force that they were disposed to them at least. I, I think that yeah, that, I think that was a factor in their willingness to see whether this could become a um, you know a sort of stable and acceptable um, government. Yeah, I think because if you just stepped back and looked at the region in the 90s where the U.S. didn't really see any interest in Afghanistan, kind of ignored the emerging humanitarian crisis. There were certainly parts of the democratic public that were animated by the status of women under the Taliban and the withdrawal of rights to education and work. But the kind of realists, the, geo, the real politic types in the government would tend to look at the map and see, you know, well, uh, it's Russia's underbelly, so Central Asia matters to us. Some influence there that keeps the Russians off balance wouldn't be bad, and the Taliban provided that, um, at least in theory. And then, yeah, and, and the Taliban were hostile to the Iranians, and the Iranians were a much more notable adversary of the United States than the Taliban. I mean, it really does underscore, in my opinion, I mean, you may disagree, um, just how ridiculous U.S. foreign policy has been over the last 25 years that you said, you know, in the year prior to 9-11, you had Iran and Afghanistan on the, on the cusp of going to war. And by what, the 2003 State of the Union address, you know, you have this axis of evil. And I think the average, the average American wouldn't have comprehended that actually there, there was yeah. enmity between Iran and Afghanistan. Yeah, well, they, couldn't, they couldn't look you know, a potential success in the eye and and recognize it as that. I mean, the the, the diplomats who who were involved in trying to uh, reconstruct a post-Taliban Afghanistan following the defeat of the Taliban in the fall of 2001, uh, when they went to the famous Bonn conference where Hamid Karzai emerged as the kind of interim leader, the the people in the room, the people who were already opposed to the Taliban and who had been working with Ahmad Shah Massoud and the handful of guerrillas who had held out against the Taliban during the 90s, they were the Iranians. Uh, and the Iranians were like, yeah, we, we like your idea. We want to we, we help you form this government. And, and, they, and they actually worked together constructively to build a consensus across ethnicities and, and various kinds of uh, post-Taliban groupings. The Iranians were seen as part of the solution for a couple of years, and then, you know, the the uh, they offered to cooperate on terrorism after 9/11 because Sunni radicals were not their friends, um, and they didn't want to be tarred with accusations that were inaccurate. So they, they said, "Look, people cross our borders; we collect passports of Al Qaeda types. You know, happy to share that with you." And the Americans, I mean, there were some in the government, as I understand it, like Colin Powell and others in the diplomatic side who said, yeah, we should should see where this goes. Maybe we can get out of the box that we've been in. But there was just such fervor um, and ideological conviction that the Iranians could never be cooperative or reliable that they ended up in the axis of evil speech, even though they really hadn't done anything recently, uh, but be constructive negotiators. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, your more recent, your most recent book focuses on Iraq, and great book, and it's what four hundred and eighty pages odd. Um, but that first, for me, the first sort of hundred fifty pages is so informative, particularly on the Iran Iraq conflict, and again, the madness of U.S. foreign policy in all of this, or, or incoherence is a better word. Um, let's go to Iraq, but just to start from the top, why did Saddam Hussein want nuclear weapons? Because he clearly did, right the way back through to the early mid nineteen seventies. Deterrence, I think, primarily, and parity. Um, um, he saw Iraq as a modernizing industrial and scientific nation that deserved to have whatever weapons um, uh, Israel possessed, and that any other modernizing middle power possessed, like Pakistan and India, didn't see any reason why he Iraq shouldn't. 
on behalf of the Arab world would have been the way he said it, mm. um, even if no other Arab nation had it. Iraq would, of course, defend the Arab world. But, you know, it is interesting, and I try to write about it in the book, um, at the moments when his scientists or others draw him out on the why, why are we doing this? He just talks about deterrence and refers to the balance of power between the United States and the Soviet Union during the age of mutually assured destruction. Maybe not the ideal way to prevent war, but there was an understanding that nuclear weapons were, their their purpose was to prevent conventional war, and as well as nuclear war. And that was the way he said the Arab world required nuclear weapons. In fact, there's one speech where he says something to the effect of, you know, the Americans ought to actually just give us nuclear weapons to balance Israel because then stability will take hold just as it did in Europe during the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. Now, that was implausible, but you could see that conceptually that's what he was thinking about. Was, was Saddam Hussein a stupid man? I know it's a, a strange question to ask, but if one of your sort of strategic priorities is attaining nuclear weapons, which they overtly said, and then you embark on this ultimately failed war, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. There's kind of a, a major conflict there between those two objectives. The Kuwait war, I think he thought that he was going to get away with it. <laughs> and, and then if he had, it wouldn't have been stupid. He would have doubled his oil reserves and, and uh, you know, imported a lot of Mercedes Benzes from Kuwaiti showrooms and other things that he intended to do. And I think he couldn't have imagined, um, in fairness to him, the coalition that assembled against him. It was a distinct moment in history. Berlin Wall had just fallen and Gorbachev was willing to cooperate with Bush and in kind of endorsing um, a demonstration project of expelling Iraq and reversing the the takeover of Kuwait, which was a defenseless country, not a particularly popular one, but um, in it was it was a brazen enough smash and grab crime that you could rally the world around it, since nobody wanted to be on the receiving end of such aggression. He is very aggressive. Um, he could be very shrewd, but also strategically self-defeating. So I think he wasn't stupid in the sense that he was like deeply read. He was an autodidact, self, self-made, self but he read extensively. And he could be incredibly prescient about the world, especially about power. Um, and he kept power in very dicey circumstances for an awfully long time. So he, he was good at it. Yeah. Um, but he miscalculated he, he thought he was a much better military tactician and strategist than he was. That was his downfall. He, he really didn't understand war or how to wage it, and yet he insisted on micromanaging. And then he didn't want strong generals around him because he, feel, he probably correctly thought they might move against him. So he populated the top of his uh, military with, with dopes or relatives who, who were just there because he felt he could trust them. And so... In that sense, he was stupid. And Saddam and sort of various um, cheerleaders of Saddam have said that actually the United States gave them permission, um, implicit permission, to invade. Is that true? No, I don't think so. It was just, it, it was bad, uh, bad statecraft, but not an invitation. So at the time... Um, a lot of attention focused on a meeting between Saddam and an American diplomat, uh, April Glaspie, the first woman to rise to the rank of ambassador and an Arabist, fluent Arabic speaker, had been ambassador elsewhere before she went to Baghdad. And she had a meeting with Saddam about three weeks, two to three weeks before he invaded. And transcripts of that meeting have been produced, one based on her notes, another based on the Iraqis, and they're not very different in important ways. And in the course of the meeting, um, she says, she talks about the dispute between Iraq and Kuwait in less than martial terms. I mean, she says, we think such disputes should be resolved by peaceful means, and um, it would be a violation of international norms if you were to do otherwise. But it's not like, don't even think about it, or if you do, we will do X. And she was thrown under the bus by the Bush administration after the invasion because they rightly came under a lot of pressure. Why did you not deter this? Why did you not anticipate it? 
And so they said, well, we had a woman in charge. And I mean, I mean one of the of my efforts going back, I'm just calling it like I see it, but you go back through the record and it's completely unjustified and, and, and sort of infuriating in the benefit of hindsight. Because first of all, uh, two things that we know now. Um, one, uh, Saddam had already decided to invade long before he had this meeting with her. He had a secret plan to loot uh, Kuwait that he had, though it was not widely shared within his government, it was operational and it was not going to be reversed. And all of the diplomacy that he was undertaking was just to create conditions in which he could execute that plan with the least resistance. So uh, that's first of all. And even he and Tariq Aziz and others who were involved in the meeting with April Glaspie have since said in fairness to her, we'd already decided, it didn't matter what she said. Uh, but secondly, if you want to say, well, the United States should have done much more to signal tough resolve or to deter him, to tell him he would pay a very high price or to allow him to imagine what would happen to him if he did this um, in the hope that, that he might change his mind, um, all of what she said, everything is now absolutely clear was written for her by the White House. She was just doing what ambassadors are supposed to do. You're not supposed to freelance and make up policy. Like you don't get to choose what the position of the United States is. So everything that she said was written out for her as talking points and sent to her by the Secretary of State and was all originated in the White House. So if you want to blame somebody for not delivering the message, it was President Bush who failed to do that. And who was the Secretary of State back then? James Baker. Um, you know, both pretty competent in terms of at least being well-informed about foreign policy. But the reason that they missed it was, one, he was lying about it, but two, and this was H.W., you know, he was a foreign policy president. He had been a CIA director. He'd been a UN ambassador. He knew all of his peers in governments around the world. So he thought, and a, you know, journalists might work this way. He said, I should talk to the people who really know this guy before I reach any judgment. So he was always on the phone in the months before with King Hussein of Jordan, uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, King Fahd in Saudi Arabia. And he's like, I'm worried. What? And you can see the transcripts. It's like, I'm worried. What is going on? And they would all say, it's just a bluff. Pay no attention. And in fact, you'll make it worse if you try to threaten him or send any signal that you're displeased with what he's doing. Because he was in a dispute with Kuwait over the forgiveness of loans that Kuwait had made to Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. And all of the other governments had been in similar disputes with him, those who had been lenders like the Saudis, and they'd all settled their debts with him. They'd satisfied him by forgiving the loans. And they all figured the Kuwaitis were about to do the same, and he was just bluffing because the Kuwaitis were holding out. So they basically steered Bush wrong. And after the invasion, he said, oh, well, you know, I got bad advice. <laughs> but, you know, then, of course, you're responsible for your own decisions in this world. I mean, it, you make a very compelling argument. And in a way, you think, wow, that's chalk and cheese with what subsequent presidents have done in terms of trying to get, you know, local advice. If only mm. the White House did that with the Saudis and, and what they should do in, in the Red Sea, for instance. I mean, it's, mm. you know, they have a diametrically opposed position in that case. But at the same time, this is a guy who's just prosecuted an eight-year war with Iran. He's used chemical weapons, as we say in British English, willy-nilly. Like, mm. And you you talk actually about the, the numbers involved of, of, of really just extraordinary use of chemical weapons, both against uh, the Iranian military, but also against its own native population. This is in every way a, a rogue state. It's a rogue actor already, even though th those words weren't necessarily in circulation. And yet, you know, you have this sort of very nicey-nicey conversation between a US diplomat and this madman, frankly. And in, in, in retrospect, it does seem really striking that the US would just be so soft with him. And it goes back to what I mentioned a moment ago, the Iran-Iraq war. You, you said it as well. This extraordinary episode of eight years, an eight-year war, a million people die, around half a million people each side. And tacitly, I mean, maybe you won't say that. It seems to me there is a tacit endorsement of Saddam Hussein using chemical weapons against Iranian forces yeah. by the White House. Yeah, there was. I think there was a maybe even more than tacit. Um, and it was cynical. And uh, it does explain the softness of the policy toward him on the eve of the invasion of Kuwait because that policy was really 
the extension of an of a an accommodation of Saddam that dated back to 1982. And the reason that it developed was because of the Iranian Revolution and American fears of Iran. So, you know, Saddam started the war with Iran. He invaded Iran without provocation in September 1980 and immediately got bogged down, uh, miscalculated. Uh, the death toll started to rise on both sides, but the lines of the war were pretty static. And then in the spring of 82, the Iranians looked like they were about to break through Iraqi lines and maybe drive straight to Baghdad. And Ayatollah Khomeini had vowed to overthrow Saddam and to hang him from the nearest light post. And the Reagan administration in Washington, looking at this through satellite photography, panicked. And they thought, well, we already have enough trouble with the Iranian revolution and the amount of oil that funds its ambitions in the region. If they double their holdings by taking over Iraq and establishing a Shia theocracy, Iraq being a Shia majority country in Baghdad, that's not going to be good. So they send the CIA officer into Baghdad carrying satellite photographs, and he provides that advantage to Saddam, and they start tilting secretly toward Iraq throughout the 80s while publicly uh, declaring a policy of neutrality. And um, they maintained that tilt toward Saddam even as his use of chemical weapons became, you know, gr grotesque and visible all across the, the world. And they felt obliged to make public statements saying, Iraq, you shouldn't use chemical weapons. You should abide, you know, you should abide by international law. But then we can see in the diplomatic meetings, they would they would quickly reassure the Iraqis, well, we need to say this because we need to, we, we would prefer that you win the war without chemical weapons. We understand you have a conviction that you need them to defeat the Iranians. And we do need to make statements from time to time, but don't overinterpret them. The, you know, the credits for exports of uh, American agricultural goods and other advantages aren't, you know, imports to that Iraq wanted from the United States, all that's continuing take note. So don't don't overestimate our public statements about your chemical weapons use. And it was clear. Saddam learned his lesson that the Americans would um, accommodate all kinds of aggression that broke international norms. And I think when he got it in his head that he deserved Kuwait, um, and he didn't really see any signaling from the Bush administration that, that said otherwise. I mean, after, the, after he was captured, um, Following the 2003 invasion, he more or less said and to his interrogators, you know, if you didn't want me to go in, you should have should have made it clearer than you did because I kind of thought, you know, you were standing back. Which makes sense. Again, yes. you know, like, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah. if somebody's effectively <laughs> endorsed the use of chemical weapons, you think, well, okay, fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this, this was not, it was, you know, Kuwait was not a popular country even among um, its Gulf brethren and it was a very wealthy country and um, the borders between Kuwait and Iraq dated to the Ottoman uh, Empire and the British uh, period and there had been disputes ever since the Brits left the maps behind and it wasn't just Saddam who made a claim on Kuwait, prior Iraqi leaders had done so. There had been even mobilizations of armed forces to try yeah. to threaten the absorption of Kuwait into Iraq. So he had a story to tell and, and uh, it was well known to international governments. Was this a nadir for US foreign policy? Obviously, you, you know, you've been one of the foremost um, writers covering this period really from the early 80s right through to today. Was this as low as it got for the U.S. in I would the 1980s? Say 2000 and 2003 was probably a lower point. In really, than, endorse, the, in, than endorsing the use of chemical weapons? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, that's fair. I mean, in, 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 uh, in the history of humanitarian crises that the United States might have influenced during that period and, the, and just the horror of breaking the norm against the use of chemical weapons. Nobody had used chemical weapons in um, war, but for Nasser in um, a brief period when Egyptian expeditionary troops were fighting in Yemen in the 60s, I think that's the only other kind of big time that they were used significantly. But that was almost not known at the time. But these were like right in plain sight and had become normalized in the war between Iraq and Iran. And 
you know, the world had managed to get in from World War I through the entirety of World War II without chemical weapons being used on the battlefield. So that norm was as established in the minds of, of leaders who didn't care about international law, you know, as diverse as Hitler and Stalin and, and everybody was prepared to use them if they had to, but nobody crossed the threshold until Saddam and then the Americans didn't do anything about it other than make some you know, weak statements in public. There's also this extraordinary whataboutery, which I don't like as a word, but it, that's the only way I can describe it in the book where you say, you know, the Americans even go as far as saying, well, maybe the Iranians are using it too. You know, right. we, don't, we don't know. Which was just propaganda, really. I mean, I think the there was no credible evidence to support that, but they were looking for any argument that might take the edge off of their own hypocrisy in public. And so to say, well, both sides are doing it was seemed to the communicators a way to to indicate that their position was more principled than it was. Now, there wasn't much evidence to collect, so they could take advantage of the fog and, and sort of say, well, it's uncertain. Uh, I guess, you know, in some metaphysical sense, it was uncertain. But there was no positive evidence of Iranian use. And even after the passage of time, I don't think um, there's any convincing record that they were used systematically. Of course, they'd, they might have prepared and done some testing, and there might be some some uh, shells that were fired here and there, but nothing on the scale of what the Iraqis did. And did Saddam once use chemical weapons in the first Gulf War? Because that was something else which I read, and I was like, wow, that is incredible. Well, he might have used them against his own people after the uh, first Gulf War, but I don't think they were very effective, so he stopped and switched over to tear gas and, and uh, smoke bombs and that sort of thing, try to put down the rebellion that that he faced after his failure in Kuwait. But what's interesting about uh, chemical weapons in the, in the Kuwait war is that he did deploy them and he expressed an intention to use them. But this time, um, the George H.W. Bush got the deterrence equation right and he sent Baker to, now, now having been schooled by Saddam's invasion, uh, he now assumed the worst about him. And, he sent Baker to Geneva to meet with Tariq Aziz, uh, Saddam's principal envoy. And Baker, you know, we don't have like a perfect transcript of the meeting, but essentially he said, uh, it, it, it sort of sounded something like this. We're about to fight a war, a conventional war. We are arrayed with you. We've got 40 countries. We've got tanks. We've got artillery. You're going to lose this war. Uh, you're going to lose it quickly. There's really no reason to fight it. If you want to withdraw, it's not too late. But if you seem determined to fight it, so fine. We will fight the war and you will you will lose it. And we're going to drive you out of Kuwait. But if in the course of that war, you use chemical weapons against any of our forces, it's going to be a completely different thing. And we're going to obliterate your civilization and you know, you're not, you're not going to survive in power. And so it'll be a different outcome and a different kind of war. And Aziz took that back to Saddam, and he had at that point already deployed chemical weapons uh, to the front lines. They were in artillery shells, they were with artillery units, and he was planning to use them, I think, with the best evidences. And then at the last minute, he reversed himself, and he said, he'd always said, you can see on the tapes, he'd always said, I alone decide if we use these, so don't think that this authority is with you the way it was during the Iran war. Like... Every single shell that gets fired, I'm going to decide. So, but I want them forward. I want them ready to use. And then after this meeting, um, there's, he basically reversed himself, and not not a single one was used. And the there's another set of conversations where he he interprets what Baker said as the Americans are going to nuke us, and he always had this conviction that either the Israelis or the Americans might preemptively use nuclear weapons on Iraq. And so he tried to um, implement civil defense procedures to evacuate Baghdad's population to the countryside. And they started publicizing this around Baghdad. And there's one meeting uh, that's recorded where his brutal cousin, um, known as Chemical Ali, Ali Hassan Majid, who was one of his main lieutenants, then and later, um, says to me, he says, you know, boss, like, you are scaring the children of Baghdad. <laughs> You're going to stop talking about nuclear war. And he says, look, I mean, it's a serious thing. You know, I think it might be coming, and I'd rather get people out of the city if it is. So anyway, to me, as unpredictable as Saddam was, as aggressive as he was, 
it was a it was a striking instance where deterrence actually worked. Um, they told him, you know, you if you cross this line, the following things will happen, and even he thought twice about it. What a madman, though. I mean, even <laughs> contemplating using chemical weapons against the United States in yeah. like 1990, 91 is just yeah. crazy. Like, yes, yeah, not not very not very wise. Uh, if, if you're even if your goal is merely self preservation. Again, going back to Iran, I mean, Donald Rumsfeld is a you know a famous figure for most people post 2003, but he also played a, a really big role in terms of US foreign policy in the 1980s. There's a great line from left-wing politicians, I'm sure it's the same in the US as well, in this country, you know, how does the United States know that it, how does Rumsfeld know that the United States, um, that Iraq used chemical weapons while well, they, they check the receipts? Mm. Um, you really document how the Americans didn't just... Uh, permit the use of these weapons. They even gave the locations of where Iranian units were located to the Iraqis so they could use them. And they kind of knew that they were yeah. going to use these chemical weapons. Yeah. Where's Donald Rumsfeld fit in all of that? Well, he kind of had a brief turn on the stage, but it was an important one um, in 84 and 85. So he was at that time a, an executive in the private sector and he got summoned into government uh, he had, I think, already been in Congress and had left Congress. But in any event, he had served in government during the 70s. He was now in business. And um, George Shultz, who was then the sec Secretary of State, uh, asked him to be Reagan's special envoy to the Middle East. So wandering around. At the, at the time, the principal um, focus was Lebanon, uh, the Lebanese Civil War, and the role of Israel and Syria in perpetuating it. And Rumsfeld, working on that problem, saw Saddam and the American access to Saddam, the friendly, you know, if quiet relations that they enjoyed as potentially a lever that he could use to try to stabilize Lebanon. So that was the, his initial reason for going in there. And uh, But he was one of the few Americans during that time at that level uh, to spend time with Saddam one on one, uh, and he had a long meeting with him um, in 1983, three or four, and uh, then he came back a second time. But the second time he came back, the Americans had scolded Saddam in public for his use of chemical weapons, and Saddam refused to see him. What's interesting about the impact of that on American foreign policy later uh, was. We can now see, and some of it's you know new material from the Chilcot report, the big investigation of the decision to participate in the Iraq invasion carried out in this country. Thousands and thousands of pages that I went through, and what I found so valuable was that there's a lot of new information about American decision making in there. Um, but when uh, the Bush administration in the fall of 2000 and one and into 2002 was trying to think about whether to take military action against Iraq. Even though Rumsfeld ended up being an advocate for the war and is mostly now seen as kind of a, a an intellectual father of the war, and he was, um, but he's much more amb ambivalent uh, early on about what should be done. And he's the only one who kind of writes these memos, some sometimes just to himself, <laughs> where he says, you know, Maybe we should talk to Saddam. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe we could. Uh, there's one memo in which he says, you know, as painful as it would be to see him live out his years on the south coast of France, that would be a lot better than the war we're about to wage. And so he starts to think about, can we bargain with him to go into exile or something? Um, and it was because he he had met him and he understood something of the the kind of. Um, opportunism that Saddam sometimes represented, and he thought maybe this this could be a way to avoid a war. You talk as well about how Clinton just said, look, I, politically, I cannot speak to Saddam yeah. during the 1990s. Yeah. Um, I cannot speak to Saddam. It will just it will go down terribly um, with the domestic political audience. And reading that, it really got me thinking about today, the present events with regards mm. to Russia and the United States. Mm. And this is not to adopt a position on, on what should or should not be done by the US State Department, but there is almost this performative aspect where they say, we will not talk to Putin. Nobody should talk to Putin. And I just wanted to ask you, really, do, do you think that 
lesson hasn't been learned? Because it seems quite obvious to me that through the 90s, starting with Kuwait, through Clinton, 2003, there is al almost an aversion to just direct one-to-one -one communication with the person that matters, Saddam Hussein. Is that the right read on it? And, and is that something that we've seen since then? And then thirdly, where does that come from? Yeah, well, I think it is accurate. It is a description. It is an accurate description of what was happening with Saddam during the 90s. Um, and it is an accurate description of what seems to dominate our policy towards Putin uh, post-Ukraine and why. So I, I think one reason is the kind of incentives of domestic politics. Um, presidents don't get credit for taking the political risk of engaging with an adversary. And, and that seemed to be what Clinton, for example, is saying in that transcribed phone call with Tony Blair, in which he says, Blair has just come to power. He says to Blair, have, have you, have you, as far as you know, has anybody in your government talked to Saddam in the last five or six years? And Blair's like, oh, I just got here. I don't think so. I'll check and let you know. Uh, and, uh, and then Clinton says what you attribute to him, like, I, I can't do it domestically. And, and it's because he would be roasted by his political opposition. They would take advantage of even in, intelligent, uh, well-intentioned contact. So that's one factor. I think, look, I'm not a practitioner of governmental, like, foreign policy. Uh, good thing, no doubt. But what I can also see if I were in their shoes and thinking about the consequences of such contact, if it were known, is like your main, the main instrument of national policy is sanctions, right? So uh, we can have a separate conversation about sanctions being ineffective and disproportionate, and I would, you'll find me in agreement with all of those assertions about them. But the, th the reality is that sanctions is what you're, you're doing. That's your alternative to war policy, sanctions. I'm going to put pressure on these guys. And it's a it's an unwieldy coalition of countries whose cooperation you require, and they all have their own reasons for wanting to get out of U.S. led sanctions. But the U.S. because of it, the dollar's uh, dominance and the banking system and the rest, they can squeeze you if you if you refuse to cooperate. So, but it's a it's every day they get up and try to herd the cats on sanctions, like, no, you cannot do that, or no, you, can, you should not do that, and persuading people to join sanctions regimes. You see this going on around Russia now, and a lot of countries that are otherwise allied with the United States, like India, might say, I'm oh, sorry, we have our own interests, but you, you know, they, they decide what pressure. Well, if you start talking to the target, then you're just giving all of your reluctant sanctions partners a reason not to participate. And so I can see that they wouldn't want to do that. Now, What's the answer to that? I mean, if I were president, I think I would have someone talk to them in secret. <laughs> it's like, isn't that what you have a secret service for? I mean, that's how it gets done most of the time. And you can always set it up to, you know, to deny it or to say, um, well, yeah, there was some contact, but I'm not going to get into it. It was super secret squirrel stuff. And, you know, I'd never talk about that. But you could develop very rich conversations. And most of these countries, they don't want to be talking in public for their own domestic reasons either. It's not like Clinton talking to Saddam on the phone. It's like having a regular set of communications that are informative. And I think, you know, from a from a journalist perspective, like you all, of course, you always want to talk to people, good yeah. people, bad people. I mean, we talk to serial murderers in prison because we want to know more about what, how the world works. And, you know, you, you learn things through contact. And Do you think that this aversion, because it, it goes beyond, you just talked about the domestic political system and there, there are no incentives. I think that's all correct. But it's something I've noticed more recently. I think it's to go with the emergence of social media. You know, I was thinking about CNN sending somebody to mm. interview Saddam in the early 1990s. Mm. Hugely brave decision. Mm. You know, I think Ted Turner talks about it in his autobiography. He talks about Colin Powell, you know, saying, please don't do this. Right. Right. Um, and now you have Tucker Carlson. This is no comment on Tucker Carlson's mm -hmm. politics or his professionalism. Mm. But, people, you know, he goes to interview Putin and says, this is outrageous. Mm. How could you talk to him? And like you say, the instinct of a journalist should be to talk to people. I think Ted Turner was right mm. to send somebody to speak to Saddam in the early 1990s. But it does feel like, as a culture in the West, even even sort of more pacifistically inclined politicians, again, you don't have to agree, agree with them, when they say, look, let just, let's just let get people around the table and talk and let's see what happens, mm. those people are sort of lambasted now mm. as, as idiots, peaceniks, mm. you know, peasers. Mm. Has that got worse or, or 
Has it always been like that? I think it's much worse. I mean, I think social media probably amplifies it. I mean, politics is generally polarized, and maybe social media has had a role in that. But and the polarization just intensifies the the kind of opportunism of opponents in just looking. It may may or may not be sincere, but they're just looking for opportunities to to weaken their opponents and. If you talk to a bad guy, you're you're opening the door for such, uh, and then you can organize a campaign around it. It can be sustained. It can be it can be distorted, and yeah, that's just sort of another day in the life these these days. So yeah, it it does take um, does take a certain amount of bravery. I think you can bring publics along. I've seen you know national leaders do that. I mean. Donald Trump, for, for example, somehow managed to convince the American people that it was a good thing that he go over and make a deal with the dictator of North Korea. And, and uh, as outraged as the conventional foreign policy elites were by the way he went about it, you know, he relied on his own kind of common sense performing uh, instincts and you know, it was the whole thing was silly, but he managed to get away with it politically. So, you, you know, you can decide that you to build a narrative around your own boldness in breaking conventional wisdom. But to me, the thing is more practical than that. Like you don't benefit from being isolated from an adversary who threatens you. Mm -hmm. I mean, the closer you get, the more information you're going to absorb. And even if you're just being instrumental about it, the information will help you uh, prevent the adversary from hurting you. Why would you not want more information about what they're thinking, about what they're doing, probe them, challenge them? And maybe you could something better than that will come out of it. Maybe you can find a way to stabilize the relationship and avoid conflict that's unnecessary. But you're never going to get down any of those roads if you just stand there uh, from a distance and and caricature your adversary in ways that embarrass them in public and that don't contribute any new information to your system. Mm. You mentioned sanctions a moment ago. Mm. Do they work as a tool of foreign policy? Because they were used extensively in, in Iraq in the 1990s. You know, at the time I remember, you know, just about. Um, people talking about half a million people dying as a result. You talk about that yeah. in the book. That's probably massively overinflated, but, you know, tens of thousands of deaths as a result of these sanctions. But what's clear to me from reading the book is that they don't really have any advantageous political effect. Yeah. Uh, and obviously now we have sanctions on Iran, on Russia, Cuba, many places besides. Um, do they work? Have they a history of working? And the political science literature now is pretty well established. I mean, it is very well established, actually. No, they don't. There is no evidence that they um, achieve the coercive outcomes that they're designed to achieve. Now, you know, you can go to a political science conference, and there are many of them devoted to this subject, and you'll get people sort of changing the subject and saying, well, it's not really the right way to measure them as to, they're designed to prevent Vladimir Putin from um, waging the war in Ukraine. Were they effective at that? No. Were they, you know, but did they make it slightly harder uh, than it would have been without them? Yes, uh, because you has to work harder, may pay more for imports that he would otherwise get. Um, but the, I think the main finding of a lot of study of historical applications of sanctions in lots of different settings in every continent in the world, lots of different stated outcomes that were being sought through the sanctions, the general finding is that population-centric nationwide sanctions are particularly ineffective. And this has led to you know, a greater faith in targeted sanctions. So there's, you know, 20 people around Putin and every one of them should feel it. So we're going to sanction them by name and so forth. But, you know, even those targets, I don't see a lot of evidence that targeted sanctions are working any better than general sanctions. The advantage maybe is that populations suffer less through the delusional practice of applying them. <laughs> but um, the hypothesis that, you know, you can change the equation inside an autocracy by hurting the businessmen and others who benefit from the regime, and they will then convince the dictator to change course. I mean, I do remember covering the pressure on Milosevic in Serbia when uh, NATO finally tried to end the killing in Bosnia by 
uh, going after Milosevic. And they did target like 50 people around him in the hope that those people would go to Milosevic and say, you need to call it. You need to stop this. And it did unfold chronologically that way. I, I haven't really read anything, you know, persuasive one way or the other about whether that theory of the case actually played out and influential people had conversations with him they wouldn't have otherwise. But that's it. That's that's kind of the state of the of the field as I understand it. Sanctions one oh one. So this book, your most recent book, looks at Iraq, its relationship with the United States all the way through to 2003. And I think many people go, oh, that's the least interesting bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it does really get on to, I think it's obviously very interesting, particularly the stuff on Iraq, Iran. Uh, but it does get to the sort of several months prior to war, lots of really interesting stuff. You talk about Colin Powell's you know, famous presentation to the UN and so on. Did Bush and Blair actively seek to mislead global institutions like the United Nations? They actively misled global institutions like the United Nations. So what were they thinking? I mean, you know, how much were they self-conscious about the exaggerations? How much were they indifferent about the exaggerations? I mean, I think, you know, I'd leave that to everybody to read the record and draw their own conclusions. I was really struck by uh, some conversations early on prior to 9-11 between Tony Blair and Clinton, because the, a lot of those conversations, at least the kind of san the sanitized, unclassified conversations are now available, uh, minuted and transcribed in the Clinton library. And for, <laughs> there's this one conversation that Clinton and Blair are having about striking Iraq after Iraq has thrown out the UN weapons inspectors in 1998. And they're going to really hit him for four or five days and call it a day just to punish him for doing this. And and uh, they're talking about the planning. And, and Blair starts to say, well, you know, if we could tell the public X, Y, and Z about we've set back his nuclear program for 20 years, that would make the strikes much more justifiable in the minds of the British public. And Clinton's like, yeah, but we actually have to follow the evidence. <laughs> sort of, or he's, he's very politely, he doesn't want to offend them, but he says, you know, oh, great strategic communicator. Yes, but I actually need to follow what my intelligence agency reports to be as, as reliable. And so I just kind of laughed when I read that. And then, you know, later, um, obviously, you know, Blair compared to Bush is the, is the strategic communicator. And he's, there's a lot of content in their interactions about his advice, about how they should be messaging this, um, but also increasingly his desperation that the messaging isn't sticking um, and isn't effective. And I think the Bush people were just much more indifferent about what got into speeches and so forth. I, and I, they didn't really have a political problem to solve because they had, uh, you know, a post 9-11 traumatized public that believed rather quickly through various rhetorical speeches that Saddam was responsible for 9-11, you know, uh, shocking numbers in opinion polls, 60, three quarters in the yeah, book. three quarters of the book, you know, people who were persuaded of this. So, and that's, that's an even less nuanced question of whether or not he still had WMD such as he had demonstrably used in the eighties. I mean, this was more like he actually did 9-11. So, uh, anyway, um, there indifference to intelligence facts in some of the speeches that the president gave and that others gave or that they rolled out on the Sunday talk shows. You know, we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. These vast overstatements of the evidence about where Saddam's nuclear program stood in 2002 or 2003. I don't think they, they were um, spending, staying up late polishing those sentences. They just bulldozed everybody. They bulldoze the intelligence community and they bulldoze the public. But I think Blair comes through in these conversations as much more panicked, much more worried about the selling proposition and much more of a crafts person. So I sort of, without knowing quite how to describe his his level of cynicism, um, I see him as much more involved, much more motivated about the messaging.
Yeah, I find it amusing, you know, post-2016 with Brexit Trump, we had this massive conversation about fake news, conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, well, look, in the early 2000s, three-quarters of Americans thought that Saddam was responsible for 9-11. I mean, that is a pretty big, bloody conspiracy theory. Um, it was responsible for, I think, the, the biggest foreign policy era by the United States easily since Vietnam. Um, and that's sort of not... Yeah, so the, we can't blame Facebook. Or well, now it's TikTok, of course. Um, so, you know, conspiracy theories have only existed since the mid-2000s. Um, on, on, on Blair and... Um, Bush, you're familiar with the transcripts, the conversations. Did did Blair ever think that actually this may be an illegal war and I might actually have to face some kind of legal comeuppance? I think he was worried continually about where his um, empowered legal advisors would come down. And, you know, he had a lot of precarious processes in the run up to war he had that one like what is the what is the it's not the attorney general who is in charge of pronouncing solicitor general, solicitor general. Mm -hmm. um, so where he was waiting for that advice um and the advice was contingent on another set of precarious processes which was the un resolutions and whether or not the second resolution would be consistent enough with um the you know with international law or 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 whether it would be judged to be the basis for an illegal aggression and so these things were interacting with each other and the and the americans were basically following bush i mean following blair because they had decided that they would go to the un for his sake to keep him in the coalition um and i think condoleezza rice bush's national security advisor also thought that it would be better for American politics if they had uh, UN endorsement. Um, but I don't think President Bush or Dick Cheney believed that. And they, they quickly had buyer's remorse after they decided to go to the UN. And I think they sort of blamed Blair for dragging them into this, you know, endless negotiation with the Chileans and the Norwegians and others over the wording of the resolution. And they, they quickly became impatient and said, let's just go. And um, and there's these very interesting points, pivot points that you know a close reader of the Chilcot report would be familiar with, but I wasn't. Where where Blair is just trying to manage these two tracks uh, simultaneously, and he's delaying telling the Pentagon that he'll send British troops to war for as long as he humanly can, because he wants the UN resolution to come first before he commits to war. But then the Pentagon comes to him at a certain point, I think it's in December, and says, look, either you tell us that you're ready to plan for war, or, or we're just going to go without you when the time comes, because we need these three months to get ready. And he says, okay, secretly, you can plan for war, but I will decide. You know, So he keeps all of his options open right down to the end, and then um, he keeps thinking that some kind of WMD is going to be discovered and that will rescue him from his dilemmas. Uh, and then he just right off the cliff at the end. There's that famous intelligence report, which again, you know, intelligence reports aren't meant to be for public consumption. They're meant to be for the politician in receipt of the intelligence, which was published. The forward was written by Tony Blair. Yes. Which is just, when you think about it, it's so extraordinary. Yes. It's such a break with convention. And so much of the stuff in that report was either circumstantial or just so weak, nobody serious thought it stood up. And yet he put his name to it with the forward. Right. And I just feel like in retrospect, that was such an extraordinary risk. Because we still have this conversation, you know, more than 20 years later about, okay, well, should Tony Blair go to The Hague? And I feel like releasing the intelligence report was one thing, but to write the forward, like you say, this was, and I, you, you were talking about, you know, who's always concerned it seems to me he was always concerned about the strategic communications implications, yes. you know, the, 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 the yes. messaging. He didn't actually think, well, you know, we could break the law and there will be legal consequences mm -hmm. for me personally if I mm -hmm. break the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's such a compelling case. Between this book and a great podcast series um, hosted by David Dimbleby mm -hmm. um, about um, the invasion of Iraq, I think, crikey, there is a really strong argument for this man to face some kind of scrutiny. Mm 
at The Hague. And that's not some sort of polemical, provocative mm. point. Mm. When you look at the evidence, it's actually very, very powerful. He, he behaved in a way that we've not seen from a British prime minister, I can't speak for the United States, uh, arguably ever. We have a lot that have done worse, I think. <laughs> we wouldn't have California if that weren't true. So anyway, no, we have a lot of, of history of conquering continents through the presidency that doesn't look very good in retrospect. But in the democratic era, I'm thinking, obviously, you know, you talk about... You know. No, I think we haven't... I'm trying to think. I mean, there was deception. Gulf of Tonkin, Vietnam was kind of oversold and sold through deception. Um to Congress and the public at important points. And then there was the very familiar, you know, light is just around the corner, the kind of you know, complete overstatement of the evidence of what was happening in the war. But um, in terms of like the actual packaging and selling of, a, of an aggression in advance, um, you know, against international opposition, the Iraq case in 2002, 2003 is distinctive and American post-war history. I can't think of anything like it. Steve, we could have done another 90 minutes. Predictably, because it's a, it's a great book. It's a brilliant home. All your work is brilliant. Thanks so much for joining us here on Navarra Media. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.